Inventing the Inimitable, Meeting Charles Dickens, with five tips for enjoyable reading of his novels. Let's pause for a moment and look at this image. We see here a modern man, a custodian, cleaning a restroom. Make a list in your mind about the details that stand out to you the most here. Now consider his life outside of his job. Where do his parents come from? Is he married? What are his children's names? Does he have hobbies he's passionate about? What teams does he root for? What pictures are on the walls of his home? What does he worry about late at night? What childhood dreams does he still yearn to fulfill? If this man were one of the approximately 2,000 Dickens characters, we would know the answers to these questions, and a lot more. Among many other factors, Dickens' attention to the overlooked and the marginalized makes us better readers, unable to take any moment or person in his novels for granted. At the end of chapter one of Oliver Twist, the narrator reflects on the infant Oliver wrapped in cloths and how, in this universal wardrobe for babies, Oliver could have been, quote, the child of a nobleman or a beggar. Incidentally, the man in the image here is California State Senator Alex Padilla, who spent a day walking in the shoes of a custodian in his district. I think Dickens would have appreciated this role reversal. Oddly, I'd like to begin with an anecdote from Dickens' funeral in 1870. This passage is taken from the beginning of my favorite Dickens biography, Dickens by Peter Ackroyd. <coughs> Charles Dickens was to be laid in Poet's Corner. Around him were the busts of Shakespeare and Milton, and at the end of the short ceremony, the organ sounded the dead march. His grave at Westminster Abbey was left open for two days. At the end of the first day, there were still 1,000 people outside waiting to pay their respects. So for those two days, the crowds of people passed by in procession, many of them dropping flowers onto his coffin, among which, his son said, were afterwards found several small, rough bouquets of flowers tied up with pieces of rag. There, in the ragged bundles of flowers, no doubt picked from the hedgerows and fields, we see the source and emblem of Charles Dickens' authority. Even to the laboring men and women, there was, in his death, a grievous sense of loss. They felt that he had, in large measure, understood them, and that in his death, they had also lost something of themselves. So if after reading some of his fiction, you're interested in reading about Dickens' life, there are many excellent biographies available. He's one of those rare artists whose life, in many ways, is as interesting as his work. I'm going to highlight 16 key anecdotes for this brief biographical sketch. Invariably, I'm going to leave out many essential details, but Dickens' life was full of essential details. <coughs> Dickens was born in 1812 in the great English seaport of Portsmouth. He was the second of eight children, a sickly child, but... His family life was very happy. Much of Dickens' happiness is rooted in his early love of reading. He actually recalls that perhaps Little Red Riding Hood was my first love. He loved Shakespeare, the most quoted author in his novels. He loved fairy tales, and he loved the 18th century stories of adventure that filled his father's bookshelf, stories like The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. Later, his famous protagonist, David Copperfield, tells us that in his childhood, quote, I read as if for life. So did Dickens. In 1822, the Dickens family moved to Camden Town, a poor neighborhood in London. Family's financial situation had grown desperate as his father John Dickens had a dangerous habit of living beyond the family's means. Eventually, John was sent to prison for debt in 1824, when Charles was just 12 years old. <clears throat> Following his father's imprisonment, Charles Dickens was forced, at 12, to leave school to work at Warren's boot-blacking factory alongside the River Thames. 
at the rundown rodent ridden factory, Dickens earned six shillings a week. He worked at the factory for six ten hour days every week, sticking labels on bottles of boot black with pieces of string over and over again, hundreds and hundreds of times per day, abandoned and exiled from the life he had once known. This was a period of terrifying limbo for Dickens, a time where nothing seemed to happen and there was no escape. It was the best he could do to help support his family. Looking back on the experience, Dickens saw it as the moment he said goodbye to his youthful innocence, stating that he wondered, quote, how I could be so easily cast away at such a young age. He felt abandoned and betrayed by the adults who were supposed to take care of him. Perhaps above all else, the experience at the blacking warehouse taught him that he could only rely on himself and his own industry and determination, a fact that would drive his entire life. His father came into a small inheritance and one day, passing the factory, was ashamed to see young Charles in the factory window working away. He took Charles home, but Charles's mother had grown accustomed to the income and wanted Charles to stay at the factory. John Dickens won this domestic debate, but Charles Dickens admitted later in life that he never forgave his mother for this betrayal, as he saw it. After just a year in the factory, just under a year in the factory, Dickens returned to school very briefly. In 1827, at the age of 15, he had to drop out of school and work as an office boy to contribute to his family's income yet again. As it turned out, the job became an early launching point for his writing career. Throughout his entire life, he had approximately three years of formal schooling. <coughs> the utilitarian philosophy of Jeremy Bentham provided the foundation to the most important law passed in Dickens' life, the New Poor Law of 1834. Bentham's argument was rooted in the presumption that people choose their circumstances, and that if England made being poor a torture, fewer people would choose poverty. As a result, Bentham saw governmental assistance of the poor as a counterproductive evil. Bentham's philosophy provided a rationale for making relief unpleasant, so that people would not claim it. It would stigmatize relief so that it became, quote, an object of wholesome horror. Inspired by Bentham's happiness calculus, look that up, one of the creators of the new poor law named Nassau Sr. said, quote, Man is seen to be an enigma only as an individual. In mass, he is a mathematical equation. It is a short step from this philosophy to the torturous use of the treadmill, to the workhouse's mandatory segregation, wives from their husbands, children from their parents, and to the systematic destruction of thousands of bodies and spirits every year. Authorities believed they could contain the toxic influence of poverty and stop the spread of degenerative behavior. The workhouses were meant to scare people into productivity and to bully them into self-sufficiency. Dickens satirized this social evil again and again throughout his writing career. Within a year of being hired in 1832, Dickens began freelance reporting at the law courts of London and the House of Commons. His job was to use shorthand to copy speeches that were imbued with Benthamite philosophy, treating human beings like variables in a grand calculation. Imagine, with Dickens' passion for social justice, as well as his own life story, how he must have felt as he copied these speeches word for word, his hand moving almost against his will. If you think about it, this is the perfect recipe to make Charles Dickens the novelist. <coughs> After publishing some prose sketches under the pseudonym Boz, Dickens, in March of 1836, began publishing a comic novel based on the adventures of some Cockney huntsmen. The Pickwick Papers took off once the comic character Sam Weller was introduced in Chapter 10. The novel made a deep impact on the country's popular culture. There were Pickwick cigars, Pickwick pin cushions, Pickwick note paper, toasting forks, and products of all kinds. 
It is in the world of Pickwick in which the public saw that Dickens wrote for them and about them. From the very beginning of his writing career, the relationship between Dickens and his audience was the most rela important relationship of his life. <coughs> Halfway through publishing his wildly successful comic novel, The Pickwick Papers, Dickens shift gears and begins publishing his second novel, a very different novel entitled Oliver Twist. Among other distinctions, this novel shocked Dickens' reading public, who had grown accustomed to Dickens' comedy in his first effort. Oliver begins with the death of a mother. It features the grotesque details of the workhouse and the profound inner life and loneliness of the sort of child, Oliver, who, until Dickens wrote this novel, was anonymous, nameless, and a faceless statistic. Oliver Twist is actually the first novel with a child protagonist, that is, a main character who remains a child throughout the novel. Dickens was the first novelist who thought this subject worthy of such attention. Curiously, Lord Melbourne tried to dissuade the young Queen Victoria from reading a novel about, quote, workhouses and coffin makers and pickpockets. Lord Melbourne continued, I don't like that low, debasing style. Yes, there are many comic moments in Oliver Twist, but this novel is a blow to all of those who believed that the new poor law was a just act of legislation. Here, Dickens animated the effects of this legislation and gave that legislation's victims a name, Oliver Twist. Charles Dickens married his editor's daughter, Catherine Hogarth, in 1836. Catherine's sister, Mary, lived with the newlyweds as well. Unlike Catherine, Mary seemed more of an intellectual equal to Charles, and they were very close. At 17, Mary Hogarth died, suddenly, after a night at the theater with Charles and Catherine. Charles was with her the moment she died, and, according to Charles, her last words were of him. He took from her lifeless fingers a ring he would wear for the rest of his life, 33 more years. The litany of saintly virginal women in Dickens is often ascribed to the memory of Mary. As he wrote to his friend John Forster later, he wrote, She is, quote, that spirit which directs my life. During the novel The Old Curiosity Shop, Little Nell's health begins to deteriorate. The journey to the countryside is a one-way trip for Nell, and she dies at the end of the novel. Sorry for the spoiler. At the time of its writing in 1841, it's rumored that people waited on the docks of New York for the last installments of the old curiosity shop. When the ship carrying the latest Dickens arrived, the crowds yelled, Is little Nell dead? <coughs> Catherine and Charles Dickens had ten children together. But Catherine suffered severely from postnatal depression and there's evidence that she had depressive symptoms even before childbirth. Dickens did everything he could to help her, but in 1857 he met Ellen Ternan, a young actress acting in his original Arctic melodrama, The Frozen Deep. In 1858, Charles and Catherine were legally separated, and he never saw her again for the remaining 12 years of his life. She was given a house, and the oldest boy, Charlie, stayed to live with her. The other nine children lived with Charles. Later, she gathered Charles's love letters to her and gave them to the British Museum. She wanted to prove to the world that, quote, he loved me once. For those like me who love Dickens, the writer, and admire Dickens, the social reformer, it's really difficult to reconcile this man and artist with the man who shunned and humiliated his wife in this manner. <coughs> when Charles Dickens moved into Tavistock House, he made sure that every detail of it was to his taste. If you learn about Dickens, he's quite a control freak. One of the features he installed was a hidden door to his study, made to look like part of an unbroken wall of books, complete with dummy bookshelves and fictitious titles. Dickens clearly derived much amusement from the invention of titles for these volumes. They included Cat's Lives, nine volumes, and The Wisdom of Our Ancestors, which consisted of volumes on ignorance, superstition, the block, the stake, the rack, dirt, and disease. 
The companion volume, The Virtues of Our Ancestors, was so narrow and thin, the title had to be printed sideways. Biographer Peter Ackroyd tells us that Dickens wrote, directed, and starred in numerous plays and that he attended the theater nearly every week of his adult life. As a young man, there was a three-year period where he attended the theater every night. His love of the stage is obvious on every page of his writing, in setting, props, dramatic blocking, dialogue, clothes, and the colorful and clear characterization. Dickens' daughter Mamie tells a story of staying home sick from school one day. After promising to be quiet, she was allowed to stay in her father's study. She recalls him writing, as always, from a standing position, and every few minutes going to his mirror and acting out characters, oddly gesticulating and speaking like the men and women he was inventing on the spot. We learn here that the writing process for Dickens was rooted in his ear and eye as an actor. For Dickens, whose own plays were strangely lifeless and derivative, the theater was an extraordinary image of collaboration and connection between all people, an idealized world that he never saw on the streets, but only on stage. One could argue that for Dickens, the street was his primary stage. Lastly, it isn't a coincidence that after the public humiliation of his marital challenges, that his first response was to embark on a public reading tour meant to re-engage with the most important people in his life, his audience. As actor and scholar Simon Callow writes, at his writing desk, Dickens felt like an emperor. In the theater, Dickens felt like a god. In my opinion, Dickens' best, best novel is Bleak House. In this novel, Dickens attempts so much. He introduces two separate narrators, including his only female narrator. He has many different plot lines, about 100 characters, ample commentary on the poor, commentary on the corruption of the Chancery Court, varied love stories, a murder, comedy, mystery, tragedy. Among other unique traits of Bleak House, it is in this novel where Dickens introduces English literature's first detective, Inspector Bucket. The Staplehurst rail crash was a derailment at Staplehurst, Kent on June 9, 1865. The train derailed while crossing a viaduct where a length of track had been removed during engineering works, killing 10 passengers and injuring 40. Dickens was traveling with Ellen Ternan and her mother on the train. They all survived the derailment. He tended to the victims for hours, working among the dying and the dead, some of whom died while he was with them. The experience affected Dickens greatly. He lost his voice for two weeks, and afterwards was nervous when traveling by train, using alternative means when available. Dickens died five years to the day after the accident. His son said later that Dickens never really recovered. As he was giving injured men and women drinks of water from his hat, he recalled that he had left the copy, the only copy, of the latest installment of his novel, Our Mutual Friend on his seat in the train. He returned to the train car, teetering on the track, and he retrieved the pages. Dickens never missed a deadline. <coughs> Dickens was considered an accomplished actor, e even by other accomplished actors, and he used his dramatic instincts to conduct public readings of his works. He performed for packed houses in England and America. There's no modern analogy to Victorian readers seeing and hearing the real Charles Dickens read great passages of their favorite novels to them. People would faint at the gruesome, gruesome death scenes and laugh themselves into tears at Dickens' comic moments. According to Simon Callow, these readings were a significant part of his identity, yet his insistence on giving these readings, even while quite ill at the end of his life, quite literally killed him. All in all, he prepared 18 different performances in which he enacted the roles of 89 of his favorite characters. If you're wondering which of his novels Dickens loved most, Dickens wrote, quote, Like many fond parents, I have in my heart of hearts a favorite child, and his name is David Copperfield. 
And yes, this little boy here playing the young David is actor Daniel Radcliffe, who grows up to play Harry Potter. So you'll notice Dickens gets you places, right? Dickens' novels were printed between the years 1836 and 1870, and it is an amazing fact that none of his 15 novels have ever been out of print. <coughs> According to John R. Greenfield, in his Dictionary of British Literary Characters, Dickens created 989 named characters during his career, and at least that many unnamed characters, approximately 2,000 in all. On the top left, we have Fezziwig from A Christmas Carol. Dickens described his dancing as winking with his legs. On the top right, we have Fagin from Oliver Twist. On the bottom left, we have the gin-loving crook from Bleak House, who famously dies from spontaneous combustion. And on the bottom right, we have the very humble villain Uriah Heep from the novel David Copperfield. And here are Dickens' novels with their respective dates of publication. You'll notice that ten of his novels were published in monthly installments, or as they were called, numbers, and five were published in weekly numbers. Dickens wrote late in his life, I have never written without the publisher on my heels. His early writing was published at a fever pitch and with very little planning or outlining. His later novels were grounded in a more clear set of outlines and plans, and as a result are often more tightly structured. During the publishing of a novel like Oliver Twist, he was also publishing another novel simultaneously. Early on, he was publishing Pickwick along with Oliver Twist and later Nicholas Nickleby. Writing two such novels simultaneously would require him to compose about 24,000 words per month. Also, the modern reader usually ascribes Dickens' supposed long-windedness to getting paid by the word, but this is a myth. Dickens wasn't paid by the word. He was paid by installment. Regardless of how he was compensated, Dickens' style isn't rooted in money. Rather, Dickens believed that the right words could describe people, places, and stories truthfully, that he could really get it. The right number of words in the right order could capture a story for his audience. This, this fact, this bold hope, not financial benefit, is the root of his writing style. Okay, so to conclude, we have some suggestions. These suggestions apply to all great and challenging reading. Some reading we do is easy, requiring no intellectual work. Think of a lot of the reading we do on the beach, for example. As an English teacher, I come across a lot of people who have this tendency to apologize to me when I ask them what they're reading, and they'll say things like, well, the novel I'm reading, it's just brain candy. So personally, I think there is a time for candy. I do feel there is a time to stretch ourselves with our reading, too. If you wish to engage authors like Dickens, here are five suggestions that I think will help. <coughs> First, relax. You don't have to understand every word, every illusion, every moment. Here's an example of what I mean. This is the famous opening passage of probably the best Dickens novel, Bleak House. Chances are that most, readings, most readers opening this novel don't know what the bold-faced words mean. Maybe you do, but I think most readers you'd have to look, would have to look those words up. Incidentally, I bold-faced those words. Those aren't Dickens' bold-faced. You'll notice that, above all else, the streets of London are dense with fog. I think that comes off very clearly. But try reading this passage and, and see if Dickens is giving us something beyond a weather report. London. Michaelmas term lately over and the Lord Chancellor is sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth, and it would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus, forty feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill. Smoke, lowering down from chimney pots, making a soft black drizzle, with flakes of soot in it, as big as full-grown snowflakes, Gone into mourning, one might imagine, for the death of the sun. Dogs, undistinguishable in mire. Horses, scarcely better, splashed to their very blinkers. 
foot passengers, jostling one another's umbrellas in a general infection of ill temper and losing their foothold at street corners, where tens of thousands of other foot passengers have been slipping and sliding since the day broke, if the day ever broke, adding new deposits to the crust upon crust of mud, sticking at those points tenaciously to the pavement and accumulating at compound interest. Fog everywhere. Fog up the river, where it flows among green eights and meadows. Fog down the river, where it rolls, defiled among the tiers of shipping and the waterside pollutions of a great and dirty city. Fog on the Essex marshes. Fog on the Kentish heights. Fog creeping into the cabooses of collier brigs. Fog lying out on the yards and hovering in the rigging of great ships. Fog drooping on the gunwales of barges and small boats. Fog in the eyes and throats of ancient Greenwich pensioners, wheezing by the firesides of their wards. Fog in the stem and bowl of the afternoon pipe of the wrathful skipper, down in the close cabin. Fog cruelly pinching the toes and fingers of his shivering little prentice boy on deck. Chance people on the bridges, peeping over the parapets into a nether sky of fog, with fog all around them, as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. Gas, looming through the fog in divers places in the streets, much as the sun may, from the spongy fields, be seen to loom by husbandman and plowboy. Most of the shops lighted two hours before their time, as the gas seems to know, for it has a haggard and unwilling look. The raw afternoon is rawest, and the dense fog is densest, the muddy streets are muddiest, near that leaden-headed old obstruction, appropriate ornament for the threshold of a leaden-headed old corporation, Temple Bar. And hard by Temple Bar, in Lincoln's Inn Hall, at the very heart of the fog, sits the Lord High Chancellor in his high court of chancery. Okay, so this is a bit much if you've never seen this passage before. It's the opening of the novel. And here's a suggestion. Instead of trying to decipher what English teachers ask you to do forever, which is what the passage quote-unquote means, at Dickens' most descriptive moments like this, instead, try to see where he takes us as readers. Where do, where do we go as we read? For example, how do we go from London streets to dinosaurs to the death of the sun to apprentices to the law courts? Perhaps above all else, we see here and in so many places in Dickens that even when we don't know what all the words mean, we can travel with him. We can get impressions, which will communicate feeling, drama, and character. The setting, incidentally, is a character in Dickens. You don't need to know what Michaelmas term or blinkers mean to know that. As time goes by, your ear will get tuned to the language, but you can't worry about understanding every word and every allusion. You'll stop too often to actually experience the story. Just relax and read and let Dickens take you on the trip he wants you on. Okay, so number two is read or don't read. This is a big suggestion. It's probably the most important tip I have about reading in general and about reading Dickens specifically. I teach Dickens every year because I love him, but also because in the 21st century there are very few activities we do in isolation. We drive and text. We watch TV and play video games. And some of us eat in restaurants with a loved one, but insist on checking the Patriot score every five minutes. They're winning 14 to 3, by the way. Dickens demands our full attention. I know. Teachers are saying this all the time. And I feel like a curmudgeon for saying it again, but it's true. His writing demands that we turn our phones, TVs, and computers off. That we sit up straight, not in bed, we turn the light on, and we just read. If a tweet, Instagram post, status update, or the Patriots mean that much to you, don't read Dickens. At least, not right now. Come to him when you're ready to just read. But you might ask, why spend all this effort to read? And why read such difficult material? My somewhat predictable, nerdy English teacher response is that once your ear is tuned to Dickens' language and your brain and heart are tuned to his vision of the world, reading him offers a special kind of pleasure that is worth working for. Third, 
Get a good audiobook and read along with it. There is no better way to tune your ear to Dickens' language than to listen to his stories read aloud well. Readers like Simon Vance and Jim Dale make books come alive, help us distinguish the characters' voices from each other, and they can even aid in our comprehension. Most of all, this is just a fun way to read, and it's a way that forces us not to skim, and it forces us to pay attention to every moment in a deliberate way. So first, I think the best option is to encourage your local library to acquire the audiobooks you want. They're going to have some Dickens already, I'm sure. Secondly, YouTube has numerous uh, free audiobooks of every classic. Um, some, unfortunately, are read by quite indifferent Americans. And I, I feel that for a Dickens novel like, say, Oliver Twist or David Copperfield, that comes off pretty strangely. Um, there's one version of A Christmas Carol that begins, Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Okay, I'm being mean, but I'm being kind of honest, too. Don't waste your time with bad reading. Search YouTube for the right fit for you. You'll probably find something good. And you know what? The easiest option is, if you're reading to yourself, you're reading the book, and you find a passage to be really funny, really dramatic, or just amazing writing, even if it's just a sentence, Read it aloud to yourself. There's nothing like Dickens' words in your mouth. Four, learn your Dickensian tolerance and plan your reading accordingly. So I am not a runner. If I wanted to begin running, however, I would add short moments of jogging during a walk, eventually working myself to running for maybe five minutes, then 10, then 15 minutes, etc. I would be utterly delusional if I put on sneakers right now and pretended that I could just magically run 10 miles throughout town. People try to do this, though, with reading all the time. Look, if you haven't read a novel like a Dickens novel in a while, it might be best to read one chapter at a time, maybe even listening along to an audiobook occasionally. Try 15 minutes at a stretch. Build yourself up gradually, just like with exercise. And plan your reading time like many people do with exercise. Plan the time of day where you won't be distracted and, and be in a well-lit, comfortable room. Okay. Tip five. Sorry about the confusion. Tip five. Margins matter most. Skim at your own risk. Here's what I mean. Here's the type of paragraph most of us tend to skim as we read novels. <coughs> we have here Fagin, who's a character we don't even know that well yet, very early on in the novel Oliver Twist. And Dickens goes on for several sentences here describing Fagin's living space. We might think, who cares? In many novels, setting description is worth skimming because it's filter. It's the writer's obligation to describe a place. That's it. Often there's no meaningful connection between the place and the rest of the story. The place, in other words, is not alive with meaning. But as you'll see, Dickens plays a very different game. Dickens is always working on us, even when describing a character's hat, or the color of dusk as it hits a building, or a painting of a girl on a wall. So let's, let's listen to this description of Fagin's lair. The walls and ceiling of the room were perfectly black with age and dirt. There was a deal table before the fire, upon which were a candle stuck in a ginger beer bottle, two or three pewter pots, a loaf and butter, and a plate. In a frying pan, which was on, a, on the fire, and which was secured to the mantel shelf by a string, some sausages were cooking, and standing over them, with a toasting fork in his hand, was a very old, shriveled Jew, whose villainous-looking and repulsive face were obscured by a quantity of matted red hair. He was dressed in a greasy flannel gown, with his throat bare, and seemed to be dividing his attention between the frying pan and a clothes horse, over which a great number of silk handkerchiefs were hanging. Several rough beds made of old sacks were huddled side by side on the floor, and seated round the table were four or five boys, none older than the Dodger, 
smoking long clay pipes and drinking spirits with the air of middle-aged men. These, all crowded about their associate as he whispered a few words to the Jew and then turned around and grinned at Oliver, as he did the Jew himself, toasting fork in hand. So Dickens gives us the lighting of Fagin's lair, its varied objects, Fagin himself, and he gives us the boys around Fagin and what they're up to. Pay attention to all the things we don't know that a modern author would give us straight away, like Fagin's height, marital status. We do know that he is shriveled, has red hair, and somewhat ominously, his throat is bare. Also, we get a strange description of the boys who smoke, drink, and most interestingly, have the air of middle-aged men. This descriptive paragraph does lots of work for Dickens, very subtly. Most interesting to me is that our first encounter with Fagin shows us that everybody grows shriveled and prematurely old around him, including his own body, his own home, and even the boys who do his bidding. If I were to stretch that interpretation even more, I might say that around Fagin, death moves fa life moves faster towards death. So it doesn't matter if all this goes over your head upon first read. I'm not even sure if this is a correct interpretation. But, you know, the fact is, some moments will hit you more than others. This one just happened to stand out to me. So I implore you, don't skim Dickens. He's at his most interesting when you least expect it. <coughs> and to conclude, an episode of Doctor Who a few years ago was titled The Unquiet Dead, in which Charles Dickens saves the world from the Guelphs. At the very end of the episode, as Dickens and the Doctor are parting, Dickens realizes that Doctor Who knows much about the future. He asks the Doctor, Will I be read? The Doctor says, Yes. And Dickens continues, asking, How long for? And the Doctor says, Forever. So just as a little appendix here to my talk, I just wanted to share with you a handful of really helpful resources if you have any questions about anything Dickensian. The number one website for all things Victorian is the victorianweb.org. It's primary source documents, biographical sketches, material on books, fiction, nonfiction, everything. One of the best Dickens pages is the charlesdickenspage.com. Number three is this really awesome video game the BBC put out and your job is you're this little Victorian boy, and you have to survive Dickensian London while acquiring a certain number of shillings. And you meet various uh, Dickens characters along the way, and you learn things about his novels and his world. And if you get a certain number of shillings, you get to meet Charles Dickens. That's winning the game. It's very clever. Four is actor and writer Simon Callow's talk on Dickens. There's, a, there's about 35 or so minutes on, on Callow's... Uh, history with Dickens. And then he gives about a 45-minute lecture on Dickens' life, particularly highlighted by Dickens and how he's influenced by the theater. It's brilliant. It's incredibly easy to listen to, not dry. I mean, even if you're not a weird English teacher like me. Five, um, I got to meet John Jordan at a conference, and he's a teacher at UCAL uh, Santa Cruz, and he runs the Dickens Universe Project, and their website is full of great stuff. Six, uh, I think the best long book on Dickens, and it's a weapon you could kill an attacker with this, it's about 1,200 pages long, is Dickens by Peter Ackroyd. I think it takes a lot of confidence to just have the title of your biography be Dickens. And I think the best short book on Dickens, just a couple of hundred pages, is Simon Callow's book called Charles Dickens and the Great Theater of the World. Happy reading and good luck. <laughs>